we finished Second Peter. We, we did First and Second Peter together, and I hope that was a blessing. In, in meditating and praying and thinking uh, about what to do next uh, on Wednesday night, I, I, I feel very strongly and really feel like the Lord has laid this on my heart, and I hope it will be a blessing. I will spend a few Wednesday nights on prayer. Uh, we, for our church, and what we're taking on here to reach out into the community, uh, folks, that's a big deal. Here it is. It's an expensive deal. It's a big deal. Uh, I think everybody's heart is right about uh, why we're doing that. Uh, it isn't just to get the church to grow. It's about reaching people with the gospel, first of all. And secondly, uh, so many people are drawn to... Uh, This is any way to say it. Uh, places where they're made to feel good and entertain. Right. That's pretty much the modern church. And 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 you know we like company and we have a good time and we love each other and we laugh and sometimes we cry. But church is about coming and uh, fellowshipping with believers and visiting and singing and praising God and praying and getting your spiritual cup filled, teaching and preaching the Word of God. Uh, we, we do other things too, and we can do other, do other things. Uh, we really don't because we don't have enough workers, but, but we, we just believe that we have something to say that people need to hear, amen? So we're, we're making the effort. And, uh, but, um, in God's word, nothing goes until he blesses it. And so my heart is drawn to a few weeks of going through some major prayer passages in the Bible. And, and, and maybe not anything you haven't heard before, maybe you forgot. Uh, but as a reminder, as a reminder. And... The, the verse that to me will be the umbrella verse for everything else we're going to do is Colossians 4.12 where Paul commended one of his helpers, Epaphras, by name. And Epaphras apparently was sick and could not at that point in his life go out and travel and go off and preach and teach and, and help. Paul makes a great statement there. First of all, he calls him a servant of Jesus Christ. How many times have I heard people say, why can't he do anything? Yes, you can, you can pray. Only heaven will tell us the whole story about some churches that were blessed revival that was broad and people that were helped and people that were even healed and God met needs because somebody at home because they were shut in was praying. A servant of Jesus Christ Epaphras, was always laboring fervently for you in prayers that ye may stand perfect and complete in all the will of God. Is that a good verse or what? Yeah. You know, that, 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 that's not a difficult verse to interpret. Are you in Colossians? Colossians 4.12. No, I'm in James. You all need to go to the book of James. I'm just... Uh, 
come here in this church, that's okay. That's just a-okay. How many times have I quoted a verse that wasn't even in the Bible? So it, it's okay. But I want this to be the foundation verse for a for a few weeks of lessons. First of all, Epaphras, one of you, this was not a super special one of a kind that God called super spiritual has mastered the art of reaching out to God. No, Epaphras, one of you. He was just like us. Had all the problems we had, had all the challenges. He was even sick and couldn't, couldn't go out. But one just, one just like us, a servant of Christ. Folks, we're, we're servants one of another. A servant. May God give us all servant hearts to love others and pray for others. He was just as much a servant at home on that sickbed as the Apostle Paul was out starting churches and preaching. A servant of Christ. Salute with you. He loved those people. Good motive for praying. To love people. Always laboring fervently. Here's the hard part about prayer. First of all, while we all have or hopefully have a time of day when we get alone and read the Bible and have our prayer time, but prayer is something to do all the time. As a matter of fact, praying ought to be as natural to your spirit as breathing is to your body. It's spiritual breath, always laboring. Praying is labor. Give you a little test. Someday, plan on having 30 minutes of prayer time alone. You're going to find out right away. It, it'll, it's, it's humbling. I, I guarantee you it's humbling. It's real work. And then, of course, fervently, earnestly, with zeal, knowing that you're actually helping somebody, knowing that you're talking to God. He always labored fervently for you in prayers. Here, this is called intercessory prayer. Intercessory prayer is you're making intercession. You're pleading to God for someone else. That's why we have this prayer list. And here's the desired end. That you may stand perfect and complete in all the will of God. First of all, I want you to know this what Paul is saying that Epaphras is not praying for. The truth of the matter is, a lot of times we don't know what to pray for others. We think we do. And if you can and you do, fine, pray for it. But most of the time, we don't really know. Well, here's a prayer that will never miss and God will honor it. You'll just pray that the will of God be done in the life of the person that you're praying for. You cannot go wrong. First of all, God knows that we don't know. Only God can see heart. I can't, you can't. And by the way, that's a good thing. Always labor and fervently for your prayers that you may stand perfect, mature. The, the New Testament word perfect is our word mature and complete in all the will of God. So, I, I want to spend some time in prayer promises the next few weeks because as a church, I've led you to undertake this project to 
reach out in this community. And God will have to give the increase. We're the laborers, but God has to give the increase. And we have to pray for that. So, uh, we want to talk about some things and remind us about some things. So this evening, first of all, I'd like for you to go to the book of James. Chapter number five, verse number 13. While you're turning there, I, I want to remind you a couple of things about James. James is the equivalent to the book of Proverbs in the Old Testament. James is the New Testament wisdom book, like Proverbs. Is the Old Testament wisdom book. Matter of fact, in the introduction, James 1.5, if any of you lack wisdom, let him ask of God that giveth to all men liberally and abradeth not, and it shall be given him, but let him ask in faith. I've never done it, but in this little book there are literally a dozen or maybe two dozen different subjects. Just hit on. Now, the book of James, it does not say who it's written to specifically because when, when a church got a letter, let's say they, they um, prepare what I was talking about last Sunday morning about the, the big leaf that comes off from the uh, marshland by the water and they prepared and then they can write on it and roll it up. If you got one of those, what you would do, you would read it, you'd make and, and then you would make a copy and pass it on. It's only where they had. But we do know because in my text it also went to local churches because it says so in my text. So I, I want us to look this Look at this. Um, this is a text that for some reason Baptists seem to shy away from and then as we read it, you'll see why and I'll explain it. One thing that will help you to understand, initially this was written to primarily a Jewish audience. Saved, believers, but a Jewish background. And that will help us here in just a little bit. So, um, James, on the subject of prayer, in, in James 5, beginning in verse number 13. Is any among you afflicted? Afflicted is a general word for all kinds of difficulties, trials, and tribulations. From sickness to financial to enemies to you name it. Is any among you afflicted? Let him pray. Psalm 50, 15, call upon me in the day of trouble. I will deliver thee, and you will glorify me. Psalms 46, 1, God is our refuge and strength, a very present help in time of trouble. David even said, it is good for me that I have been afflicted, that I might seek thy face. Is any among you afflicted? Let him pray. Now, got to pause there and make an observation. There are people who do the Christians, well-meaning people, who, do, who refuse any kind of medical help. And they use this right here for their justification. Folks, you cannot just take a half of a verse, pull it completely out of the Bible, and then make it to justify what you want it to say. Paul told Timothy, get medicine for stomach problems. Luke was a physician. He attended the Apostle Paul in his traveling. There is nothing wrong with a Christian going to a doctor. But now listen very carefully. I would caution you about when you get sick, you never ask God about it, just run straight to the doctor. I would caution you about that. Remember the good king Asa in the Old Testament? God said, because 
You saw to the physicians without coming to me first. This disease is upon you. As a Christian, a part of being a Christian, everything in your life you take to God. And I've always said, if a pill will fix your problem, take the pill. Medicines of the Lord. Bible has a lot to say about medicine. Is any money afflicted? Let him pray. Is any married? Let him sing psalms. If you call on God when you're sick, call on God and rejoice when you get well. Amen? Now then, is any sick among you? We are going now to sickness, sick church members. Is any sick among you? Let him call for the elders of the church. Let them pray over him, anointing him with oil in the name of the Lord. Okay, now, this is where Jewish background comes in some. It, and it, we as being biblical King James literalists, uh, we have to take this at face value. Uh, if you're sick, call the leaders of the church, the pastor and the deacons. Let them come and have prayer. And by the way, we do that. But when people travel, when, when there's sickness, we, I bring the deacons up here. We pray for people. We go to the hospital uh, to pray for people before they have surgery. After they get back home, we go in the home. We practice that. So first of all, if you, if you come down sick, don't be embarrassed, don't be ashamed, don't be bashful. We love doing our job. Call us. We would love to come to you wherever you are and pray for you. So, is any among you sick? Let them call for the elders of the church and let them pray over him. That praying over him has the Conotone and the overtone, and most likely the laying out of hands. So let me talk about laying out of hands for just a minute. There's nothing wrong if you're called to go to home and pray someone for you to lay hands on them, if it's okay with them, and as long as they understand, there is no spiritual power going from the hands of the person that's doing the praying to their hand. It is a spiritual emblem of commitment to the Lord. If you're going to pray for God to heal someone, if you're going to pray for God to, to bless someone, they need to be committed to the Lord. The laying out of hands and I know, like I say, we Baptists, we run away from that because some other denominations have gone nuts over that. But biblically speaking, there's nothing wrong with that if it's understood what it means and what it does not mean. And also, those of us going to pray have to have spiritual discernment as to whether that's even appropriate for the person we're praying for. Any among you sick, let them call for the elders of the church. Let them pray over him, anointing him with oil in the name of the Lord. First of all, that was customary Jewish custom. Oil, emblematic of the Holy Spirit. Uh, emblem, oil it, uh, it, uh, comes from uh, fruit that is also used in happy occasions. So the oil is emblematic of uh, uh, the blessing of God, the help of God. There's a physical side to that. Look at the, what's happening in the medical profession in America today. There are two things in which the medical profession today is actually catching up to the Bible. One of them is we're now getting paying a lot more attention to the mind of a person that's sick in the body. They're learning what the Bible's always said. You can't disconnect the two. 
As a man thinketh in his heart, so is he. A merry heart doeth good like a medicine. In many other verses, uh, the, the medical profession is catching up with the Bible. They're learning that a person's attitude's got everything to do. Uh, how they're going to get well. And they're finding out that people with good dispositions just naturally will live longer. So the oil is emblematic of the Holy Spirit. The oil is emblematic of help from God. But the oil was also used among Jews consistently in their processes of healing people. So let me apply that. Again, I want to say, first of all, let me make the statement, and I'll qualify it. If you go to somebody's home and they ask you to anoint them with oil, and that means just put a drop here or on their head, or I don't know, put it on their nose, I don't know. There's nothing wrong with you doing that. It's not unbiblical, but you have to explain what that means. You can't just let them believe that, man, I'm, I'm healed, I got this oil. No, there's no healing virtue. Well, actually, I can't say that anymore because now they're finding out it is. Uh, I used to be able to say that there's no healing virtue in the oil, but the, but the truth is there is. That's the reason Jews used it. But you need to, the best way I can describe it is, if it's an aid to their faith, it's okay to do it. But you have to make sure they understand We King James people, we need to be a little more careful about, well, we believe it from cover to cover, then most people come to a verse like that and they'll just shy away from it. Well, that's pretty inconsistent. Laying out of hands is fine if that's what is, what is requested and it's understood and explained. Uh, um, uh, I know as many Baptist preachers who keep a little bottle of oil up there under the pulpit uh, as I do any other denomination. Now, admittedly, this is not protocol among independent Baptist churches. I understand that. But I can't help but protocol. I'm just trying to tell you what it says here really means what it says. God is the healer. Not the one praying, not the one laying on hands, not the one anointing all, not the one. God is the healer. Is any among you sick? Let them call for the elders of the church, let them pray over them, anointing him with oil in the name of the Lord. Now let me say one more thing. Those of us who are called to pray for people. It is our responsibility to keep a good walk with the Lord so that when we're called upon to do that, we ourselves are in a spiritual con condition to do that. Okay? Now then, in the prayer of faith shall save the sick. I say, uh, the laying out hands or the anointing oil, if that will be an aid to their faith because they're weak, okay. The prayer of faith shall save the sick. Not that there are no divine healers. We got people running around the country uh, posing as divine healers. No, they're not. God's the healer. Our job is to point people to God. And if we can do that with this means to sick people, okay. Let me say one more thing. When you pray for people, Unless you are just as sure as God made little green apples that God has told you this, don't say, now God's told me you want to get well. Don't do that. Unless, unless you know, you know, you know, you know, God has assured you right. Don't do that to people. I'll give you the most famous, notable example last two or three years. How many of you, uh, you're kind of country folks like me, you sometimes watch uh, uh, RFD, the Farm Channel. 
used to have a show one day on Saturday night with a married couple, uh, Joe and Lori. Of course, she got cancer and she died. I read more articles from churches who were praying for her and were dogmatically saying, she is going to get well. She died anyway. First of all, you and I don't know who's going to live and die. Uh, the one we think will live will die. The one we think will die is going to get well, not live us all. So we, we, we can't do that, people. We can pray for people. We can ask for God to heal them. Uh, we can use these tools and that will help them. But God is the healer and only God knows what you can do with them. And the prayer of faith shall save the sick. Was there a time, was when the Bible was written, a time when more people were healed in response to prayer, yes. 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 And the Lord shall raise him up. There we go. The Lord is the healer. And then notice, and if he have committed sins, they shall be forgiven him. Okay, now uh, let me deal with a uh, uh, modern uh, word of faith, charismatic Pentecostal error. Uh, they say if you're sick, it's because you've sinned. Uh, if you're saved and, and you're not living in sin, you're going to be healthy. That's not true. That's absolutely, that is not true. We get sick because we live in bodies that are meant to die. We get sick because uh, uh, sometimes uh, we fall off ladders. Or somebody pulls up in front of us and we hit somebody in the car. Or you didn't get enough sleep earlier in your life, and you didn't eat right earlier in your life, and you smoke and you drank earlier in your life, and now you're paying for those discretions. You know, we destroy our bodies first 35 years, and the next 35 years we work it, put them back together. So you can't you can't go to somebody and say, well. There must be something terribly wrong with you. God is judging you. You're sick. Please don't do that. By the way, it may be true. But it's not your job to say that. Unless God just makes an awful claim. No, we're sick because we live on a sick planet. And if, if you live long enough, every divine healer, if you live long enough, is going to get sick and die. Catherine Kuhlman. Anybody remember that name? Catherine Kuhlman. Lady, uh, divine healer in the 20s and 30s out of L.A. Was an alcoholic and died of cirrhosis of the liver. She crisscrossed America back and forth in the 20s and 30s holding divine healing services. A.A. A. Allen in the 50s. Anybody? A.A. A. Allen. The cancer crisscrossed America. Big tent came to Fort Worth annually. Big tent. I went to see him just because I was a nosy seminary student. Whole car of us, a lot of us went to see him. Man, there's a show. The offering took an hour and 45 minutes. Does that tell you something? He died of cancer. So, we, we, you can't do that, folks. Go with, a, go with a good heart. Go with a good heart. And, but if there is sin, then lead them in a prayer of confession. If there is sin, if they're believers, uh, lead them in a prayer of, of uh, confession. It shall be forgiven. Now, the main thing is, pray for God's will to be done in our person. Amen? Mm -hmm. now, this thing that we're going to start in a few weeks, pray for God's will to be done in that. Sure, we want to see people come. Sure, you know, I've got a whole list of things I'd like to see come out of that, but 
the will of the Lord be done. You can't ever go wrong doing that. Verse 16, conf confess your faults one to another. I'm not saying don't do it because this says you can do that. But you better have discretion. Private sins need to be confessed privately. I'm not saying don't do it, but I'm saying if you're going to lean on somebody and if you're going to, if you're going to confess your sin to somebody, or you better, you better get God's guidance and you better get somebody spiritual that'll keep their mouth shut or it'll be all over time. Confess your faults one to another. Um, you know, uh, it's okay if somebody comes to you pray for me. I, too many credit card debts or whatever. Uh, but if people come to you and need prayer, pray with them. But be discreet. Pray one for another. That's one of the blessings of a local New Testament church. We have folks who go to church with that we can say, would you pray for me? It's a blessing. That you may be healed. We know that large scale miracles happened only in four times in the history of the Bible in connection with uh, the, the writing of the scriptures to authenticate the men that they were really uh, God's men. But that doesn't mean God is not healing today. Because God is healing. I'll bet there's a person in this room that you have been sick at some point in your life and maybe even very bad sick. Okay, you saw the doctor, good. You took your medicine, good. But God still healed you. God still healed you. The, and here's where I was going, verse 16. The effectual, fervent prayer of a righteous man availeth much. Effectual, that is uh, fervent. It, it's really uh, like we don't, what we would, we would call it a double negative, and, and it's not, but effectual and fervent, it's really like one word pressing on another word about how important prayer is. Effectual, fervent prayer of a righteous man. Who is a righteous man? Well, first of all, that man there is generic. That's man, woman, or child. You understand the Bible is written in the masculine, God. And everything in the Bible is addressed masculine because man was made in the image of God. Woman was made in the image of man. And it's not putting the ladies down at all. So, if somebody tries to give you a gender-neutral Bible, there is one out now, uh, just, you know, just say no thanks. Matter of fact, hope you can get them a real Bible. But uh, we're talking man, woman, boy, girl, we're fervent, forever righteous man. That, that means a saved person. A saved person. We are righteous in Christ, not in ourselves. We're righteous in Christ. And the end result is a believer that keeps up his walk, his or her walk with the Lord, studies the Bible and prays, is a person whose prayers God will accept. And then the last two words I've spent 35 minutes just getting to these two words right here. Availeth much. Well, I, I don't want you to raise your hand or anything, but uh, I'll ask you a rather simple question. Do you really believe that? Do you really believe that? And if you really believe that, do you pray? I know, nothing new, but encouragement. That's my goal here for, for a few Wednesday nights as we work through some of the major prayer passages in the Bible.
I'm convinced at this point in my life. I'm convinced there are a lot of prayers that we pray. We personally will never see the result of that. We'll be in heaven before we realize and before we see how many prayers God actually did answer. We just, he didn't do it right then when we were around. But in time, God does do his work. How availeth, good prayer from good people, availeth much. Amen? Amen. All right.